Welcome and thank you for joining us for the third lecture of three for this semester series of lectures on the history and legacy of Black entrepreneurship in the United States hosted by Princeton University's Keller Center. We started this series in the spring of 2021 and are thrilled to be continuing it. I'm excited to tell you about the series and introduce you to our amazing speaker, an incredibly interesting scholar, Dr. Dan Wadwani from the University of Southern California, but he's actually coming to us today from Copenhagen, Denmark, so quite the contrast of weather, I would imagine. My name is Isen Beezer, and I'm a university administrative fellow hosted by the Keller Center and a PhD candidate at Rutgers Business School, where I study entrepreneurship from both his contemporary and historical perspectives. The center's mission is to arm our community with the intellectual foundation, innovation skills, and networks to propel positive and sustainable societal, societal impact. As a center, we recognize the pervasive and systemic racial inequity in our country and how this is deeply linked to so many of our country's most profound challenges. We understand how important it is that our community has an understanding of these systemic inequities as we work on solving some of the humanity's most pressing challenges. Uh, that brings me to today's series of lectures, to our series of lectures. For all interested in innovation and entrepreneurship, much can be learned from the entrepreneurship entrepreneurs who have succeeded under some of the most daunting constraints. For the end of the day, this is what entrepreneurship is ultimately about. It's about assembling limited um, resources for impact. Um, black innovators and, and entrepreneurs have overcome restrictive markets, segregation, Jim Crow laws, lack of access to capital, threats of violence, even death, theft of intellectual capital, and many other extreme challenges. Still, they thrived. These entrepreneurs have created innovations which have resulted in lasting societal and cultural changes far beyond the Black community. By exploring the history of Black entrepreneurship and innovation, we want to learn from the creative strategies Black entrepreneurs employed to succeed. At the same time, we want to explore how the constraints on Black entrepreneurship and business development have limited overall the overall economics of not only Black communities, but our society as a whole, and how so many of these constraints constraints which have become institutionalized can be overcome in the future. This exciting series of talks brings together scholars and academics from new, numerous institutions from around the country, uh, now around the world, thanks to Dan, to share our scholarship in a discussion-based forum. Uh, before I share a bit about Dr. Wadwani's impressive background and hand the room to him, um, during the talk, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat. Uh, if we have time at the end, I will make sure that we ask your questions. And remember, your questions are more important than mine, okay? One second. So Dr. Wadwani, um, he's a professor of entrepreneurship and also the professor of history at University of Southern California. Dan's research and teaching examines how entrepreneurial processes drive socioeconomic change. He has published in the leading journals in management and business history and is co-editor of Organizations in Time. History, Theories, Methods. Um, that's by Oxford University Press. He's the former chair of the Academy of Management, Management History Division and past president of the Business History Conference. It's, that is the leading business history association in North America. He has received numerous uh, research and teaching awards, most recently the Williamson Prize, which is awarded every two or three years to a mid-career scholar who has made significant contributions to business history. Now, without further ado, I pass it to you. Dr. Wadwani, thank you so much. My pleasure. And thank you so much uh, to you, Isan, and for everybody else for coming today. Um, when Isan sort of very kindly invited me to give a talk, he uh, said, you know, I can uh, do something that's relatively early stage, something that doesn't necessarily have to be completely polished. And I am holding him true to his word on this. This is um, really um, a set of ideas that I'm beginning to explore and think about uh, rather than a fully polished, completed project. Let me kind of spend a minute or so just sort of giving you the overall thrust of what I want to talk about and um, where I might be going with the project. And I look forward to especially the discussion because I see this as an opportunity to really help shape the direction of this project. So the topic of the talk is about sort of entrepreneurialism as a set of cultural ideas and ideologies. Um, about that 
even more so than about entrepreneurship as the practice of developing and starting new businesses and, uh, and innovating. Um, by entrepreneurialism, we're really talking about how societies and cultures sort of place values and ideas in relationship to entrepreneurship as not just about starting businesses, but as a set of mindsets and templates for virtuous action. Um, there's a burgeoning literature um, in history and in management at the moment um, that's trying to grapple with the origins of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurialism in the modern period since about the 1970s. And much of this sort of places emphasis on the rise of neoliberal values and ideologies um, focused on market virtues and their applications, not just to market settings, but to wide arenas of our lives, including social, cultural, and political arenas. The argument goes something like this, that beginning in the 1970s and 1980s, kind of there was this sort of rising influence of neoliberal ideas that have uh, sort of pervaded not just the market sphere, uh, but many of these other areas. Um, in this talk, I am uh, kind of complementing and also challenging that sort of assertion. Um, I'm interested in potential other influences to the rise of uh, entrepreneurial virtues, ideas, kind of ways of thinking, and their presence in our culture today. Um, and part of that is making the claim that, that comes not just out of market virtues, but also democratic practice and democratic ways of thinking. And that the case for that line of argument comes from, in many ways, recognizing the influence of the civil rights movement on the kinds of emphasis on, on entrepreneurialism today. And I wanna explore that using a case study of uh, an organization in Rochester, New York, beginning in the 1960s and 1970s to kind of help think about a bit about the ways in which this sort of democratic practice has had an impact on entrepreneurialism. So the context here, if we can get this to work, is in some ways, the ways in which, you know, again, not just entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship, but the language of entrepreneurship, the discourse of entrepreneurship, and in many ways, the ideas and virtues and values of entrepreneurship have seemed to grow within the United States and in many Western cultures over the last few decades. And this can be seen in, you know, very clearly in the way in which entrepreneurship as a language is used. So this is a simple Google engram of the word entrepreneurship uh, over the course of the 20th and early 20th first century. And what you see is a real uptick uh, in the use of entrepreneurship as not just a term referring to specific businesses, but in many ways in relationship to a variety of areas of life. So if you did something um, like this and uh, around the words cultural entrepreneurship or social entrepreneurship or even academic entrepreneurship, you would see very similar patterns, right? The ways in which the use of the words and the, what the words mean has, have become increasingly important. Now, as I said, that within kind of the scholarship at the moment, there's been a lot of sort of uh, attention to the idea that this comes out of a neoliberal Term. In neoliberalism, here there's an influence um, in particular for Foucault's ideas that basically that the neoliberal turn had the entrepreneur and entrepreneurship at its core, and that it's this embrace of entrepreneurship essentially as an ideology and a discourse and not simply as a practice of business that has made it pervasive in our lives, and again, not only in our lives as um, sort of as business people or as economic people, homo economicus, but the idea that this appears and uh, and has spread to other parts of the very being 
uh, that we have in our cultures today. And there's a number of kind of recent books that really excellent scholarship that has emerged around what the implications of this have been for how we educate, how people see their careers, their democratic engagement and so forth, and how that's shifted through the late 20th and early 21st century. Dan Horwitz's recent book, for example, on the emergence of entrepreneurship as entertainment and the way in which that's pervaded much of our contemporary culture, or Ben Waterhouse's forthcoming book, One Day I'll Work for Myself, which really looks at the 1970s as a pivotal turning point when business itself saw itself in crisis, in a crisis of legitimacy within American capitalism, and turned increasingly to lobbying and lobbying around ideas of entrepreneurship as a way that turned, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, American culture toward this entrepreneurial ethos um, have been landmarks for this sort of idea of, uh, of a neoliberal basis of entrepreneurship. While this scholarship is really valuable, I think what it misses to some extent is the antecedent broader critiques of organization that led and were the foundations for the rise of entrepreneurialism and entrepreneurial ways of thinking as a critique of what had come before. And what had come before was in many ways the virtues and the ideas of organization, employment relationships, hierarchies, rational ways of organizing economic systems and political systems as uh, the dominant forms of American culture and American organization. Um, by the 1950s and 1960s, these forms of ways of organizing our social and cultural and economic lives had begun to come under criticism. Books such as C. Wright Mills's White Collar or William White's The Organization Man had begun to poke at and uh, grow concerned about the ways in which those ways of defining the relationship between people and their work were not just economically stifling, but also stifling in their ways of seeing themselves as citizens, economic citizens, but also democratic citizens that was too narrow and that, that too limited in terms of its uh, sort of impact. So what changed? How did this sort of critique start to manifest itself in daily life, daily practice? I think the leap to neoliberalism in the 1970s and 1980s sort of misses a key development of the 1960s and 1970s that actually helped shape this shift. And that was sort of the development of the civil rights movement and particularly the late civil rights movement when the focus shifted from political rights at the ballot box, sort of the right to the franchise, to voting rights and so forth, towards increasingly a vision of civil rights as encompassing economic justice and economic rights of people to be able to uh, pursue sort of um, uh, kind of economic security, to pursue autonomy and so forth. Um, the case study I'm going to be talking about to explore this focuses in particular on the evolution of civil rights within Rochester, New York. Um, I chose this for a couple of reasons. Um, I did some research on this topic a long time ago within the context of the civil rights movement, not so much within the context of entrepreneurship. And I'm now kind of revisiting some of that research, um, having sort of delved for more than two decades since I initially did some of this research back into this as a way of thinking about its impact on the rise of entrepreneurialism. I'm also originally from Rochester, New York, so it is in some ways a hometown story for me um, that sort of helps, I think, for me thinking a little bit about the nature of entrepreneurship. I think it's also because some of the developments in, in Rochester really shaped uh, kind of uh, and forged developments um, at a national scale, 
um, and so had some broader significance. So Rochester offers us a kind of an opportunity in the micro, uh, in the micro historical moment, the period and the place to be able to see, I think, some of these broader processes, much broader processes going on, but to give us some sense of some tangible and situated nature to them. I will kind of in particular be focusing, you'll see the sign in the back, Phidon Inc. Um, I'll particularly be focusing on eventually in this talk, um, Phidon Inc. as an example of the way in which sort of the evolution of the civil rights movement towards an entrepreneurial bent and an entrepreneurial bent that was focused on a particular kind of uh, entrepreneurship uh, came out of the promise and ideas of this economic turn within the civil rights movement, but then also the ways in which that became somewhat more limited over time. So that's sort of the focus uh, at the tangible level of this history. So the beginnings in some ways, um, a, a important beginning point, if you will, for understanding the civil rights movement in Rochester uh, was sort of uh, um, an economic uh, uprising, racial uprising in 1964. That was one of the early um, uh, uprisings that took place during the civil rights movements in the North and the West. Um, in the summer of 1964, uh, racial tensions within Rochester boiled over into um, a kind of a, a conflict between the police and African-American citizens in the city um, and led to kind of a, a significant amount of destruction within the city, but also brought a great attention to the questions of, uh, of racial justice and racial opportunity within the city and within the context, again, of economic opportunity as much as political opportunity. The reason it was sort of pivotal was because for many Rochesterians, this was a surprise. Um, they had watched the development of civil rights movement as a political movement in parts of the South, thinking that these were not matters of injustice that pertained to them in quite the same way. But as the civil rights movement moved to many northern cities, right, uh, it pointed out many of the ways in which the injustices of racial inequality within the North were very different than in the South. So Rochester provided a way of thinking and, and looking at the nature of these economic injustices. And part of that was laid by the tensions created by the second great migration of African-Americans into many Northern cities. So in the case of Rochester, um, there was a very strong migration uh, that took place between 1950 and 19, mid-1960s um, and sort of uh, uh, kind of increased the population of the city's um, African-American uh, citizens very extensively um, by the mid 1960s, sort of Rochester, like many uh, Northern cities had become kind of hubs for African-American uh, engagement, uh, migration and community building. But at the same time, um, many of those African-Americans were left out from uh, much of the economic opportunity of the city. Rochester was a very affluent city after all. This was the hub of Kodak when Kodak was in its heyday, uh, the rise of corporate sort of giants like Xerox as well, and a very affluent city and one that thought of itself as a very enlightened city. Um, and yet sort of the, the very kind of nature of the lack of access to those economic benefits highlighted the limits of what African-Americans in the North had access to. So within Rochester, the African-American population increased by about 500% between 1950 and 1964, with almost all of it sort of limited to a couple of wards within the city. And you can understand the way in which sort of racial discrimination led to this. And these were uh, city wards where the housing stock was de deteriorated and dilapidating. And yet, as you can see here, the rents were much higher than what uh, whites were paying it. 
Blacks paid $94 on average per month in rents versus whites, 68. Unemployment was even a bigger and starker difference. Even though Rochesterians had on average a, a very low unemployment rate, far below the national average and on average much higher salaries, the disparities between blacks and whites were very strong. So whereas whites unemployment was below 2%, for Blacks, it was 14 percent. And this created sort of an understanding of the ways in which the relative gaps between what whites and African-Americans could anticipate and, and partake of within Northern American culture sort of highlighted this. As one quote said, um, the big Kodak dollar and the long sprinklers of the suburbs have seemed both tantalizingly near and hopelessly far for the inner city man. This was sort of from a study that was done in the wake of the uh, uprisings. This would made sort of worse, as I said, from the point of view of Rochesterians who saw themselves as, you know, um, in some ways sort of better than many other places. They prided themselves as a place where Kodak and Xerox and the city itself um, was in many ways both affluent, there was a very strong uh, uh, public sector and uh, 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 um, civic sector with uh, many civic organizations, um, and in some ways a, a sense that um, the this part of New York had been at the forefront of the historic uh, Black uh, rights movements of the 19th um, and um, early 20th centuries, going back uh, to even the abolitionist movements of the 19th century. So from that point of view, many Rochesterians saw themselves as sort of uh, uh, not sort of having the same kinds of problems of racial injustice um, that uh, had um, happened and took place in other parts of uh, the United States. As one resident sort of quote said, how can it happen here? We're so good to our Negroes. And the quote captures sort of the, the ways in which the injustices of the economic injustices of Rochester was often completely lost on many of the white citizens and why some of the, the institutions and ways of, uh, of thinking about race relations and race opportunities uh, were kind of new uh, within this context. One of the sort of responses, right, and this is starts to begin the development of a shift in the nature of civil rights organization, organizations and organizing in, in Rochester, many of the older civil rights organizations were, you know, quite passive in many ways. They dealt with some political issues, maybe some job training issues, but in the wakes of the uprising, the, the, the central change was um, uh, sort of the organization of uh, an organization called FIGHT, Freedom, Integration, God, Honor Today. So that's what FIGHT stood for. Um, FIGHT was organized by, uh, by a set of clergy within Rochester as initially a civil rights organization focused partly on the political uh, questions, but even more so on questions of economic justice, economic opportunity, for um, for African Americans in the city, and sort of with an idea that that would uh, be much more kind of actively engaged in, and the initial sort of focus of fight, led by, led by sort of a, a clergyman named uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt Florence, uh, was very much around questions of job opportunities for African Americans in the city, very much within the context of mid 20th century economic opportunity, the idea was how can we give African-Americans in the city access to opportunities for secure employment, the kind of employment that Kodak and Xerox had to offer. So the initial mobilization was around working with the employers in the city to create opportunities, but to create opportunities in ways that was not simply kind of just about job training, but about demanding access to employment opportunities 
along the way, right? So one of the big sources of tension and movement was this uh, was this conflict between fight on the one hand and Kodak on the other hand to sort of require Kodak to hire a certain number of African Americans with the city. That that fight would actually represent in some ways an employment agency that would sort of serve the purpose of employing a certain number of African Americans into Kodak. Kodak, a strong anti-union sort of uh, uh, establishment had, had fought this very strongly. Um, this became a source of tremendous conflict within the city um, and blew up uh, at the uh, shareholders meeting where this became one of the early attempts by civil rights organizations to use shareholder sort of um, uh, rights as a way of bringing questions of justice to the fore. In the end, um, the battle between Kodak and Fight did not result in a specific jobs program and Kodak managed to prevent any sort of um, establishment of a right to a job. But what it did do because of uh, the conversation that surrounded this was that it started to open up broader questions of, of economic citizenship in addition to political citizenship. It was questions about what should be sort of questions of the parameters of civil rights as, as, uh, as matters of economic citizenship. In the wake of the, the battle with Kodak, fight started to sort of reimagine and move in new directions uh, in addition to thinking about employment as the way forward. And this is sort of where um, they uh, sort of one of the more consequential sort of moves was to um, sort of uh, work with, in particular with, uh, with Xerox in this case, to envision what came to be known and incorporated as Phidon Inc. Okay, Phidon Inc. was um, a kind of an approach to the questions of economic civil rights that was based fundamentally on entrepreneurship. It was not based simply on job opportunities, but the idea of looking at and working between Kodak and Xerox to understand the lay of the landscape of the well-paying opportunities, the technologically future-oriented opportunities uh, that were going unmet and to help fight as a civil rights organization, set up a new corporation. And in this sense, it was a community corporation. It was one of the, in fact, arguably the first community development corporation in the United States where it would be a kind of a, a, a manufacturing, a tech manufacturing firm focused on um, vacuum tubes and electronic transformers that sold components into high-tech industries throughout Northern New York. And the vision for that was also that it would be owned by the community and by the employees. So Fight as a civil rights organization initially had ownership of Fight on Inc. with the idea that over time, employees would own a stake in it. So this was entrepreneurship, but it was entrepreneurship that A, was community-based and B, was focused on a view of entrepreneurship within the context of capitalism that involved community ownership with benefits also going back to key social services and public services and back to employees. Fidon's sort of um, vision was based on this sort of broader idea. Not to be left out, and unfortunately, I don't have a picture of this. Um, there was a response by Kodak as well, and Kodak in this case working with the Urban League to set up other opportunities. Um, the Rochester Business Opportunities Corporation was an entity that also came out of the fight between Kodak and Fight um, that focused not just on job training, but also on the development of new minority owned businesses. In this case, it was much sort of narrower in scope in, in the first couple of iterations, for example, you know, Kodak 
primarily wanted to appear to be responding to the questions of civil rights and racial justice, but was very cautious about what they were willing to give up. Right? So they literally came up with um, business plans for a very uh, limited set of kinds of corporations, for example, creating, um, creating wood pallets um, where their specifications were specifically designed for what Kodak could use as opposed to any kind of a broader opportunity. It was in some ways an outsourced vision of what entrepreneurship could mean. And it didn't have any of that same kind of broader vision of a, a, a fundamentally kind of community owned or uh, employee owned structure. Uh, rather, it was focused on minority owned, African American owned opportunities as outsourced providers sort of to, uh, to Kodak. That said, Arbok sort of started to also develop a set of consulting and ed educational programs for minority owned businesses um, in the community to grow and develop. And increasingly they became as well as an education arm, uh, an education arm that sort of uh, ended up spinning out information and, um, and educational programs that in some ways have influenced um, the development of entrepreneurship education today. Um, in fact, uh, Jeffrey Timmons, one of the kind of pioneers of university-based uh, entrepreneurship education, who wrote uh, one of the first influential textbooks in entrepreneurship, was somebody who in some ways came out of the civil rights movement and had been involved in um, entrepreneurship education and the civil rights movement before setting the basis for university basis entrepreneurship um, and early development of entrepreneurship programs. So while Arbox, in some ways, vision for entrepreneurship was individual-based rather than community-based, its sort of impact on entrepreneurship education was, and as a way of thinking about sort of uh, 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 autonomy, ownership within, uh, within capitalism, had a, a strong influence. Fidon itself, by the mid-70s, had grown, but was struggling to some extent with profitability. And at that point, um, within Fidon's board, there were changes in, 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 um, in the direction of what Fidon Inc. would represent. Um, and one of its sort of board members brought in a, um, a, a recent HBS, Harvard Business School graduate, um, Matthew Augustine, to help take on the leadership of Fidon Inc. Eventually, Augustine was able to sort of uh, also get 80% ownership of Fidon Inc. So Fidon Inc. started to evolve into, from a community-based corporation into an individual-led um, corporation. That said, um, Fidon Inc., which was sort of reframed as Eltrex because Augustine felt that Fidon Inc. was not sort of conducive to the corporate success of that entity. Um, that said, by kind of the 80s and 90s, um, Eltrex was sort of employing 350 folks within the Rochester area and had grown significantly to sort of serve not just Xerox, but Kodak and a number of other entities over time. Right? And so what you see is sort of the evolution of um, entrepreneurship as one of the key outlets for the civil rights movement in ways that in some times was sort of initially focused around a community-based sort of uh, vision and an, uh, and an employee-owned vision, um, but then increasingly also and eventually dominantly so around an individual-based vision of entrepreneurship as, um, as an expression of civil rights and as an expression of autonomy, right? So to me, kind of what this does, this sort of story does, and I, I'm still, as I said before, kind of trying to think about uh, what parameters of the story to dig further deep into, what to kind of think about, and what are its broader implications. So I would love questions, ideas, thoughts along those lines, but here's sort of the, the key directions I'm thinking of heading in. First, um, 
to sort of end up in the same place I started, right? It, to me, this sort of suggests that entrepreneurialism is not simply a kind of a neoliberal market ideology that has moved into other parts of culture, right? There is a core element of democratic practice um, that shaped the increasing emphasis on entrepreneurship as a, a form of economic engagement that involved ownership, that involved autonomy, that is central to kind of the entrepreneurial kind of ethos in American society. And that sort of goes back in some ways away. It's a ethos that emphasizes the virtues of autonomy and self-determination as political virtues, just as much as they do the economic virtues that maybe entrepreneurship sort of holds. It also kind of draws in some questions of the historical roots and periodization of our contemporary entrepreneurial moment. I think scholars of um, African-American entrepreneurship, I think are particularly well positioned to demonstrate this because of the significant role of black entrepreneurship within American history um, in that sort of entrepreneurial ideas and politics that now be become so central to the ways of thinking about um, the, the political value of entrepreneurship um, since the 1970s have much deeper roots right, within um, American culture and American thought, in part because they offered opportunities that were otherwise sort of um, excluded to African-Americans. And I think that um, in, even as sort of uh, Fight on Inc., and sort of uh, our box sort of are developing and embracing entrepreneurship as a way forward. Um, they're of course drawing on a long history of precedent in this area that um, scholars of African-American entrepreneurship have emphasized. And then lastly, I think that there's sort of something here. Um, I haven't figured out exactly what to dig into, but um, on the origins of entrepreneurship education, right? Um, what the, emphasis on neoliberal, uh, uh, neo the neoliberalism sort of term doesn't really explain is in some ways the, the kind of ways in which entrepreneurship education has been shaped by ideas of um, opportunity and the, the value of that education as um, not just about uh, developing new products and developing uh, new markets and so forth, but about developing entrepreneurs as people, right? And of the cap capability around that. And I think to understand that, um, you have to see the some of the origins of entrepreneurship education within the civil rights movement. Thank you very much. and looking forward to the discussion. Amazing. Thank you, Dr. Wadwani. What an insightful and important talk. And I'm really energized. I, I have too many notes, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a, a question. Um, we'll start with from, from the audience. Thank you again. And don't be shy. Put the questions in Q&A. Um, we have a really great opportunity to have Dan here live with us, which is amazing. All right, here's the question, sir. With more jobs requiring college degrees and less Black men going to college, do you think that we are moving backwards? How do you think our economic citizenship fares today? Boy, that's a a, a, a kind of... A a tough question that I have to say, I haven't sort of grappled with with, real, uh, with relationship to this. Um, I, I, I think that, I mean, there's, the, it's a complex question because of the ways in which college education itself is um, becoming something that you see increasing numbers of people questioning um, about the the, the relationship between a college education and um, and career opportunities. Now, I personally, as a university-based educator and somebody who's sort of educated in the liberal arts, um, feel like um, that there is a link between the lack of entrepreneur uh, of a university-based ba education and to some extent, if there are despair, you know, uh, racial disparities there, socioeconomic disparities in there. Um, I think that those are crucial drivers of access to full economic citizenship. So my sort of, you know, just to be clear that my own kind of um, 
sense, sense is that that is a significant limitation, significant barrier to that, right? Uh, but I do think that at this point, you're also seeing many people critiquing universities um, as being um, the vehicles for that. And I think that is partly based on questions of affordability, of access, and of what other options there are for education beyond just a university education. I don't know if I fully answered that question, but sort of just uh, um, take a stab at that as a way of, of responding. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question. So with civil rights, there's often a notion of getting a piece of the pie. Um, similarly, in US college sports, the revenue, there's revenue issues about sharing. So they have NIL where college athletes can now get their own sponsorships, deals, essentially become entrepreneurs, but do not get a part of the NCAA revenue that they help generate. In your work, do you see a historical precedent where employment as a piece of the pie is being pushed to the side and in lieu companies are pushing for entrepreneurship among the black population where it's kind of like you were helping, but you're not getting the thing that is the pie. You're, you're creating a whole new, a new pie. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of interesting. There's a, a bigger phenomenon that people have talked about. Uh, you know, if you can kind of think about compensation uh, and how that's moved from employment compensation to now having increasingly employees or contractors take on risks um, in addition to kind of limitations on potentially the value that they're creating. Um, this is the whole phenomenon you could argue of the emergence of a gig economy um, where, um, where um, the traditional employment relationship has completely changed, right? Um, when it comes to sports and maybe even a differential impact there with, you know, are African-Americans more likely to be in positions where their upside, their piece of the pie is limited and where they're taking some of the more of the risk for uh, for the value they're creating? That's a really interesting empirical question. I don't know what the answer to that is, but it's sort of um you know, there is this sense that sort of increasingly ordinary people are having to take more of the risk um, and sometimes see less of the upside benefits of what their labor entails. And, you know, it would be interesting to kind of empirically study the the kind of racial disparities in, in, in that too. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Keith, do you have a question? You had that look on your face. <laughs> exactly. More of a comment. I'm trying to tell my students that I've already had the final. I don't need to take it again. Um, <laughs> no, what, what strikes me about some of the stuff you're talking about, I'm sure you're familiar with Operation Breadbasket of the SCLC, yep. which is where they were trying to force companies to, um, to uh, hire Black employees. But there was also an element where uh, black civil rights organizations were trying to be entrepreneurial uh, or Congress for Racial Inequality uh, was going to put out a jazz album as mm. a way to raise money uh, to try to not be so dependent upon donors. Mm -hmm. um, the SCLC explored the idea of buying a Pepsi Cola franchise um, as a way to raise money. Uh, so they were also looking at this entrepreneurial aspect of it, but it really goes all the way back to Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. From the beginning, they were doing it. I think an interesting discussion, and I'm not there yet, we've talked about it in our class, is the notion of this group of people like Du Bois and Washington that were pushing by Black movements and Black entrepreneurship but in, in essence, we're pushing segregated economies. Of course, it was a segregated economy at the time, mm -hmm. but they were trying to strengthen it versus somebody like a Maynard Jackson mm -hmm. who pushed and forced the majority community to accept black businesses. So when he did set-asides, fought legally for years, but in the meantime, he managed to get a lot of them done. So a lot of black businesses in Atlanta were built because – 
he insisted that when they expanded Hartsville Jackson Airport, they had to have so many black subcontractors and black businesses. So I think there's an approach to, I think, one day to look at this notion of trying to push more of a buy black, black support of black businesses versus a white businesses have to open their doors to black businesses rather than trying to create sort of this segregated economy. Um, and that didn't have, that couldn't have happened until the 60s and 70s. Before the 60s, so I'm not blaming Du Bois, before the 60s, you had to operate in a segregated economy. Right. But Maynard then moved it into, no, I'm going to force the white community to accept black businesses and to cooperate with the black people. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite stories, I have teachers, students on here who are going to be laughing about this. Yeah. Maynard Jackson found out that there were the banks in Atlanta did not have any black people on their board of directors. And so he said, you have to change this or I will take the city of Atlanta money somewhere else. And they didn't believe he'd do it, but he did. He moved the city of Atlanta money to Birmingham. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. And then like two days later, they appointed some black directors and he brought it back. Yeah. And, and I think so. I think that this is where um, some of the you know story of the civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s. Right? So first of all, to your point, Keith, about um, the business of social movements, I think that is sort of um, an area that is itself um, understudied and, and uh, a really important area where you know, entrepreneurship and social movements come together. There is some research on that in general, right? But when it comes to kind of, um, you know, um, the ways in which social movements work as businesses, right? Because, you know, mobilize, mobilizing is costly, right? Uh, and so kind of creating both the revenue streams to offset that and to kind of even, um, uh, you know, kind of create change, right? It means that, it's these spin-off businesses sometimes that last a long time, right? And that actually are the goals of the change. And so that's partly kind of it, what's what's interesting here with relationship to kind of fight on and so forth. I, I don't think it was in some ways the initial intention at all for fight to be in, you know, the vacuum and transformer business. That was not, you know, their goal is a civil rights movement, right? But they were thinking about, well, how do we fund the movement, right? How do we kind of fund these organizations and so forth? So I think there's a, a really important sort of feedback loop there that's important. In terms of kind of the, you know, I, I, and, and here I kind of been thinking about some of the research um, Isan's been doing too um, with you and uh, with, uh, with Martin at, at Duke um, uh, about sort of the different kind of configurations of, you know, Black businesses and Black business communities in relationship to those communities, but also in relationship to the white community and how that gets structured over time. I think that's a really fascinating um, area of research. And I think to me, hearing and listening to some of that research, which sort of raises this question of what makes um, a, a Black business community not only vibrant, but also sometimes susceptible to violence and to kind of uh, and to backlash, right, um, is super interesting, right, in terms of thinking about uh, about some of the tactics, right, because I do think that in in some ways, sort of fights efforts to really push Kodak um, ended up both expanding the way civil rights was thought about in terms of economic rights, but also had a backlash that sort of um, limited to some extent some of its effectiveness in the long run um so sort of a set of th thoughts thank you we have we have um, a timely question about kodak from the audience as well so the question is during your presentation um, i was intrigued by how kodak tried to quote unquote seem supportive probably for pr reasons without overcoming without, without over committing support to the black community can you speak to the contemporary times and how corporations are handling their sense of responsibility when it comes to supporting issues of racial inequality? Great question. And I, I, I think that you do see in Kodak's responses, some of you know, the, the kind of um, the politics of 
early corporate social responsibility. This is in some ways the, um, the emergence of certain pressures on corporations to at least appear socially responsible, to appear um, responding while at the same time not making substantive changes to sort of to be able to um uh that that uh, that that actually changed the nature of the corporation and i think that you could say well isn't that the way all corporations work and i, I think that even in this single sort of paper what i've been struck by is the differences between kodak and xerox um you know kodak um for the most part was defensive about its priorities and rights and all throughout this period. And I think they probably became even more defensive as fight sort of pushed them and attacked them, right? Uh, but you're absolutely right there. The way they approached it was sort of a PR question, right? Yeah, sort of it, this is about corporate social responsibility, about racial justice to the community in which we're operating and so forth. Uh, but, you know, what it was as much about not looking bad at that moment, right? Um, with Xerox, um, and here I'm still sort of doing some of this research, right? There was, um, a, a kind of, you know, it, it certainly wasn't sort of just a openness to changing everything, but they were much more engaged in working with fight to identify opportunities for fight on Inc. to be a successful corporation, not simply a supplier, if you will, right? And so I think, you know, you can start to ask questions about sort of, um, uh, of the range of reasonable corporate social responsibility engagement. And from one hand, simply kind of um, sort of, you know, PR and appearing, sort of appearing to sort of deal with the issue while not in fact dealing with the issue at all, two things that are more substantive and even more creative in thinking about, well, how to address a question of um, such as sort of racial inequality, racial injustice, uh, economically within the sort of community, disparities in employment without sort of, uh, you know, while sort of still maintaining a balance of, of shareholder rights. And in the end, I mean, you know, I think Xerox sort of record around this seems like at least my first set, set of research to be much more substantive than than Kodak's. Thank you, thank you. Um, Keith, do you have something? Uh, so we have another question. So um, the clergy was mentioned uh, quite a few times with organizations. Yeah. Um, can you touch on the historical, I guess, uh, arc of the clergy as it relates to black civil rights and entrepreneurship? Maybe less, more, uh, little, how's the role changed? And anything that you think would be interesting? Yeah, this is also a really good question that I, I, I wish I knew more about, honestly. Um, so the clergy were in, in Rochester were very, um, and, and continue to be very active, if you will, of of the different civil of the different kinds of organizations, um, I would say especially kind of churches. And I, here I'm talking about black churches, but also many white churches were uh, working together. So they brought in and helped organize fight. For example, um, they su supported uh, fight and battle, battle with um, Kodak, um, and they sort of. You know, I think we're involved uh, in kind of uh, other ways, in ways that were much more substantive than other, um, even than other sort of civil rights organizations in some cases, right? And so um, I think that the role of churches is something that I've not looked enough into, but you're absolutely right that that it's the relationship between churches the civil rights movement and entrepreneurship, I think is a really interesting kind of nexus to consider uh, uh, as to how this sort of led to um, new economic opportunities as well as sort of changes in civil rights. 
Yes, going on. Uh, Keith, do you have a question? I think uh, you're muted if you if you are, if you do. Something that struck me was the notion that the Rochester didn't believe they had a problem. And I just think how much that's still true today with so many people saying, well, we don't have an issue. You know, we've had a black president. What else do we need in life? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but you can go all the way back. That is another consistent uh, as early as the 1880s, the Supreme Court was saying, you know, there's going to come a point when black people quit being a favored community because yeah. they've been free now for a decade. So what else do they want? Um, but it just goes on. But it's just it goes back to how do you get people to realize that there are problems you never even thought about? Yeah. And and I have to say, I mean, to some extent, this was also I mean, in part because, you know, you think about it in the context of um of the longer struggles for for black freedom, right? Rochester was a, a hub of the abolitionist movement and so forth, and it saw itself as progressive and liberal. And I think that's where I think in many cases, that's you know where some of those ironies come out even more, right? It's it's it was really in kind of the civil rights movement in the north um, that this you know um, was you know, for for um, for folks in the North was even more of, from their point of view, like, wait, wait a second, you know, that's not our problem, is it, right? Um, and I think in a way that it wasn't quite as much in the South, right? And well, at least as far as sort of my research has gone. And so um, it does sort of raise that question of, uh, you know, uh, within even within kind of liberal communities, often these things are really often entrenched, right? And and it's sort of what they don't even see until something like sort of 1964 happened. So fantastic! Thank you. I, I love these these Q and A sessions. Um, yeah, we, we, we have a lively <laughs> set of questions. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, we have about 30 more seconds left before we we close. Um, Dr. Wadawani, do you have any closing thoughts before we end this? Well, I just, you know, mostly want to say thank you very much for having me. The set of questions is fantastic. I think this sort of series in the community uh, is fantastic to, is on what you and Keith have um, helped build here. And I'm really excited to sort of contribute, to have the, had this opportunity to contribute to this today and to the upcoming kind of session and panel that will be happening in a few weeks. So thank you so much for including me in this. Oh, you're welcome. It's it's our honor. So um, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, again, Dr. Wadwani, you have really contributed wonderfully to our series. Um, hopefully this is not the only time. We'll certainly, you know, you're part of the family now. Thank you to Keller, Keller Center and Princeton University for continuing to enthusiastically support and host this lecture series. As a reminder, each semester we have three lectures and a concluding roundtable. As Dan mentioned, ours will for this semester will be December 13th. So please register, attend live if you can, so your questions can be answered um, directly from the scholar um, and your comments can be addressed. And finally, I want to remind everyone that all talks and events are recorded and they can be found on the Keller Center website. So please watch them, share them. Um, please spread the word as much as you feel willing. Okay, so thank you again and take care everyone. Goodbye.